Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 882 for July 21st, 2021, and we're focusing on the conversation part this time around. The reaction to last week's bonus episode from our Happy Hour Live webcast with Stephanie McLeod of Doers was so positive that we're going to keep producing audio versions of our Friday evening webcasts. We know that with many of you starting to head back to the office, it may not be possible for you to join us for the live webcasts on Fridays, and you may not be able to watch the on-demand video replays on our YouTube channel while you're commuting. This past Friday night, Angels Envy Bourbon co-founder Wes Henderson joined us on the webcast and answered your whiskey questions for an hour or so. But before we start, just a quick reminder. The streaming platform we use for our live webcasts emphasizes video quality over audio quality, so there will occasionally be some background noise and glitches. While we have cleaned those up as much as possible, what you'll hear is exactly what aired on the live webcast Friday night. Thanks, as always, to our presenting sponsors of WhiskeyCast, Redbreast and Dewars, for making these webcasts possible, along with our segment sponsors on the podcast each week, Sagamore Spirit, Riders Tears, Oban, and Catoctin Creek. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world right now. I'm Mark Gillespie. Welcome to the Happy Hour Live webcast for Friday, July 16th. We are halfway through July, and believe it or not, the end of the summer is getting closer and closer every day. Kind of miss this summer, I think, because uh, it's been one of the few chances where we could actually uh, get outside and relax and enjoy ourselves after missing most of last summer because of the uh, lockdowns. We will uh, take your comments, of course, in the chat rooms. If you're watching us on YouTube, Facebook Live, of course. If you're watching on Twitch or on Twitter, we will not be able to see your comments until after the show ends. And uh, just to sort of share with you what I'm drinking right now, uh, I have uh, this, what I call a basket of oddities that are samples that I sort of found when we were doing some uh, spring and summer cleaning uh, last couple of months around the uh, studio here, including some samples and this one, and you can't read the label, and there's just a little bit left, so I'm going to pour it back into the glass. But it is a 26-year-old 1982 Glenlivet bottled by Berry Brothers and Rudd, a single cask for the uh, Berry Zone selection range that I got back then from uh, Doug McIver and Edward Bates back in the day. And I just sort of forgot that uh, it was sitting there. So what better occasion than today to pull it out for a dram? And uh, I've had this thing. It was bottled in 2010. I may have gotten it from uh, Doug and Edward back in 2011. And it's been sitting for literally a decade around here. But it's still the uh, label. You, can, you, may not, you may be able to see it here. There's still some uh, cello tape around where this was sealed up. So uh, it didn't change at all. And uh, one of those days where it just seems like the right idea to pour a nice old dram of whiskey and uh, relax and have fun. We are going to have a lot of fun over the next hour or so because I want to bring in our guest, Wes Henderson, the co-founder of Angels Envy Bourbon in Louisville. Wes, how are you tonight? I'm doing great, Mark. How are you? Doing great. Uh, Good. You have some news to talk about, don't you, with the expansion at the distillery again, right? We do. It, it's hard to believe, you know, I mean, Mark, you've been, you know, with us since day one, you know, we've been talking about bourbon and angels envy. So it's, it's, uh, it's always nice to, to be able to visit with you, but we, uh, we just announced what we're calling brand home 2.0 and it's a 13,000 square foot addition to our brand home in Louisville. It's, it's really exciting to, it's hard to believe we're doing, we're already expanding, but um, you know, we were kind of ran out of space and we hope to bring, you know, bring more people in to enjoy the Angels Envy experience. And then, then there's a lot of other aspects to it as well. A lot of other things we can do with it. Such as? 
more uh, tasting rooms, more bars, uh, more event space, more um, I've got a place where I can entertain folks when they come in, you know, which is really cool. My own little space, Mark, where if you come in or we have folks from the media who come in, we can we've got a, a place to, to work together. And, um, you know, so it, it, it's um, and you're, you're, everybody's seeing the pictures now. I expanded retail space also. It, it just feels right. It's 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 amazing space. So the addition is actually off to if you're looking at the picture off to the far left, um, that last uh, half of the building, that's the new section of it all the way down on the left. So um, it'll be open spring of 2022. And uh, I can't wait for everybody to come and see me there. And you've been having no end of visitors even through COVID once you were able to reopen the doors, right? Yeah, we are, we're able to do limited experiences. We coordinated with our fellow Bourbon Trail members to make sure that we, you know, we were in step as far as protocols to protect the public and, and pro- protocols to protect our team. That was really the big thing, which we were able to do. But limited tours now, uh, we're phasing things open. We're uh, phasing uh, trips back into the plant. And we're, the, the big thing we're phasing is getting the bar open, which I think is should have been the first thing we opened, actually. <laughs> but uh, for logistics No reasons, personal preferences there, right? No, not at all. I mean, we make such great cocktails there. It's a shame not to have the bar open. So I just met with the team yesterday, and you know, we're talking about how to, how to bring that back in and do it safely. So how do you do it safely? How do you reopen the distillery and bring people back around your production crew? Because that was always the big concern, was that for lack of a better term, the visitor center staff was, uh, I'm going to get slammed for using this term, somewhat expendable, but your production team that actually makes the whiskey, you had to keep those guys isolated, right? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting word. I might rephrase it differently than that. but I would too, <laughs> yes. I know. Time. I'm, I'm just teasing with you, as, as I always do. You know, it. Um, we needed to protect everyone in the facility. Um, you know, we, we have a hundred percent vaccination rate with our our brand home folks, and we're we're trying to achieve that in the production areas. Also, we've erected some barriers that separate the the, uh, the visitors a little bit more from production. But but you're perfectly right. You know, we have to continue production, and and any delays in production are very costly. You know, they create holes in our inventory, and we've managed to not have any interruptions in, in production uh, since since the beginning of COVID, which is pretty amazing if you think about uh, those challenges there. So a number of things, you know, we we, we phased our shifts. You know, we, we did a lot of things to keep our, our, our teams apart. You know, we didn't mingle one team with the other in order to, to, to not contaminate. So if we had one issue, we could isolate that. It was a pretty extensive, uh, and we made our own hand sanitizer too. How about that? So uh, we we were very liberal with the application of the hand sanitizer. So how did your hand sanitizer compare to everybody else's? I kept waiting for somebody to do uh, notes on aromas, not tasting, of course, but notes on aromas from various distillery uh, hand sanitizers and all that. Ours ours smelled like new make, um, you know. <laughs> We uh, we added a little glycerin to it to make it uh, make it a little more gel like as opposed to just you know as as new make is it's very thin. Uh, I don't know. I never really compared them. I, I know it, it, it the, the the agencies that we gave it to and we 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 did donate it. We didn't we didn't sell it. Uh, the agencies we gave it to, which is also one one that I work with, also we were all very grateful to have hand sanitizer, especially very early on. You know, when, when hand sanitizer was scarce and even even as first responders, we were having a hard time getting hand sanitizer. So it was good to be able to contribute that. And I want to emphasize that first responders part, because you're not just a distillery co-founder. You are also a volunteer firefighter, too. So you you knew firsthand what it was like to uh, not have access to sanitizer, right? Yeah, there are four of us in the family that are in emergency services and, 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 and uh, some some capacity uh, in the fire service or uh, uh, doing other things as well. So, um, yeah, it, it was definitely, we noticed firsthand how, uh, how much of a struggle it was and, and working with patients and working with people that were, that had COVID, you know, that were confirmed COVID. So, you know, it was, uh, it was very beneficial. Well, I want to go back to the origin story because 
it's been 11 years now since you and your dad, the late great Lincoln Henderson, founded Angel's Envy. And uh, one of the bottles that I pull off my shelf very rarely because it stays behind glass is a bottle that your dad signed before he passed on a few years ago. Wow. And it's one of those ones that I'll open when the time is right. Uh, tonight's not the night for that because, well, you're not here to share it with me. But uh, if you were here, I'd open it, of course. But Thank you. I just wanted to set that aside and show that, yes, I do have Angel's Envy in the house. But for those who are not aware, give us the origin story after your dad retired from years at Brown Foreman, uh, being the first master distiller for Woodford Reserve and helping create that brand, how you got dragged into this because, as you've alluded, you were not in the whiskey business before you and your dad started Angel's Envy. Well, you know, I was. I mean, I worked at Brown Foreman years and years ago. And, and of course, I grew up in the business because of dad. But actually, it's kind of the reverse. I drug dad out of retirement to do this thing. And it was um, it was a crazy idea that, that I came up with and, you know, the, to do a bourbon as a family and uh, went up and talked to dad. And dad immediately agreed that it would be fun to do as a project. And uh, to this day, I don't think we knew what we were getting into when we did it. We uh, only we agreed to do it. But fortunately, Mark, we just hit it at the, the right time, the right product. You know, the finishing, the secondary barrel was something that even though there was a little bit of noise when we first started doing it, obviously now it's, it's widely accepted and, and widely uh, copied by other, by other folks. So, you know, I, like you said, I had no plans of, of doing this. and I'm glad it happened the way it happened, most certainly. And to be able to work with my dad at the last few um, years of his life, was a it was a huge blessing and to continue to work with uh, four of my six sons as of now is also a a blessing a blessing and occasionally a curse from what i've heard around the distillery right you know you never know i mean we we get along very well we really <laughs> do we really do it's uh every just like any other family you know there's sometimes friction i think sometimes between the brothers sometimes there's some competitive stuff happening, which is to be expected because they've been competitive their whole lives. And when you have six kids, everybody's competing for attention anyway. So, but all in all, it's, it's, it's been a, uh, it's been a great journey for us. Love this comment that just came in from Dave Kuhn. He calls Angel's Envy Rye breakfast whiskey because it's like a sumptuous cinnamon roll. I like that description, Dave. Very cool. How did you guys come up with the idea to do the port finishes? Uh, that's something Chris Ratcliffe was curious about. Uh, why Angel's Envy focuses on the cask finishes? At the time, as you point out, it was really, really raw as a rare phenomenon in Kentucky. Yeah, for sure. You know, Beam did it years ago with their master, their uh, masterpiece. Uh, it was okay. I, I just don't think it was time when when they did it. So. And we just felt it was the right time to, to, to give it a shot. And in the port barrel, quite honestly, it was, um, we, we knew we, we love the fortified wines and we love the flavor profiles with the different fortified wines. And we've managed to do sherry finish, Oloroso sherry, uh, Madeira, Tawny, and Ruby port. But the first, the, the Ruby port was just the jump point. And truthfully, we selected that first because they were the easiest barrels for us to get. That's the only reason why we started with Ruby Port. It could have very well been Sherry. It could have been any of the other uh, barrels that are out there. But we found a broker in Portugal that we really liked that had good access to barrels. And, and that's where we started. And, and really, one other thing, Mark, uh, I know it's kind of a long-winded response, but we didn't necessarily think that finishing was going to be our forte, you know, our our you know, that we were going to build around finishing. That was just the first offering that we came up with. But as things went along and we saw what we had started, then now our business centers around the finishing aspect of it. But that's not the way it was started. But I think it works out perfectly for you. And don't worry about long-winded answers, Wes. Uh, we're specializing in that around here right now. Long-winded is what we do best around here on the Good. Friday shows. That's perfect. <laughs> But uh, what I think it really lended itself to was that it let you guys put your own stamp on the whiskey because, as you've acknowledged, you had to source it at the beginning until you had the distillery. But it let you and your dad put a stamp on that whiskey that was unique, that was yours, 
rather than uh, just bottling somebody else's juice. For, for certain. And necessity. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, 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 the family knows how to make whiskey, so nobody would, could ever really suggest that we didn't know how to make whiskey. We also know how to blend. Um, we also know how to finish and, and then do all those things. So um, sourcing the whiskey, we needed to find whiskey that fit the profile that we wanted for Angel's Envy, which was we found some great whiskey and we continued to find great whiskey. And, and then we had whiskey contract, contract produced for us. Um, now uh, we're starting to work in the distillery produced whiskey into our blends, which is starting to happen very soon, which is great. And at some point in the next probably you know three years or so, it will be 100% what was distilled at the Louisville distillery. So, um, you know, it, um, it's, it's, and like you said, I mean, we've always been very, very transparent about that, but so it was out, a lot of it was out of necessity, um, at the very beginning. And I was about to ask when uh, you would be switching over and, and being able to start putting your own stuff in. So over the next three years, you think before, uh, you'll be able to, uh, release a 100% Angel's NB distillate? I, I think so. You know, we're still working it out when we'll make it, we'll, we'll start blending it out sooner rather than later. And then, you know, just depending how, on how that goes and, and, you know, how much we're blending in as we go along and we don't want to just flip the switch. We want it to be a gradual, uh, a gradual transition. I, I truly believe the whiskey we're making now is even better than, than the whiskey we've had contract produced for us. It's just really amazing stuff. So, but, but we're, like I said, we want Angel's Envy to be the familiar Angel's Envy that, that our, our, uh, our customers are, are used to, to seeing and, and believe in and love. So we're not going to make any drastic changes and you, nobody will probably even notice it truthfully. If you do it right, nobody should notice. Exactly. That's right. Yep. You bring up an interesting phrase, contract distilling, and a lot of people like to complain about sourced whiskeys, but I really, I'd like you to explain the difference between sourcing and contract distilling. It really starts with uh, at the beginning, doesn't it? Yeah, I think at least the, the words, the, how I use those, those descriptions is, is, is uh, sourced whiskey is whiskey quite often that's purchased on the open market that's already been aged. Um, from, from various producers and distillers have been doing that for since probably the beginning of bourbon. So that, that's not unusual. It was just done very quietly, you know, uh, uh, and contract production in my mind is, 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 is contracting with the producer to lay down new barrels. So lay down new fills uh, of whiskey. Uh, and then you, you know, you either age that in their warehouses or you transfer it over to your own warehouses. I think almost all of our stuff now is in our own warehouses, even stuff that's been contract produced for us. So th- that's the differentiation I have in my mind between between the two. But the similarity is is that 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 someone else is producing your whiskey or has produced your whiskey for you, hopefully at your specifications. And you know, and, and you know, we're we always selected barrels when we bought barrels. And we just didn't say, hey, look, if there's a thousand barrels, give us a thousand barrels. We would test production individual production days from those lots. To make sure that 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 you know, because production can can vary from you from day to day, we would pull production days and sample those before we made any decisions on on those purchases. And pretty much having close. it made to your own specifications means that you could design a bourbon that works really well with, say, a port wine finish, as opposed to just taking whatever distillery X Y Z made on a specific day. 15 exactly. years ago or whatever. Exactly. And that, that's also where the, the experience comes in in the industry and being able to, to, to negotiate those things and, and, and communicate those things on, a, on an operations level and a production level on a very granular level that, that, that some startups may not have. You know, I mean, you've got a lot of brands out there that are just putting source whiskey on the shelf that, you know, that, that, that there's not a lot of uh, technical knowledge behind that. So I think we brought that to the table also. It's kind of the, the whole package. Our pal Crump notes that he uh, literally emptied his bottle of Angel's Envy Tuesday evening, so he's drinking the Isaac Bowman port finished. Oops. That's okay. That, yeah. Hey, I rising like tide lifts all boats. 
I like their stuff. I really mm-hmm. do. So, I mean, that, 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 that just tells me that, that he needs to go out and buy another bottle, um, <laughs> which I'm sure he will. And we appreciate that. And Tabitha over in England has some Angel's Envy in a sample bottle. So that's her dram for tonight. Nurse right. Dave, uh, bourbon taint my thing, his words. But this might be different enough that I should give it a shot. Yes, you should. Um, we also had some comments about the bottle. Uh, really unique design on this. And folks like this one because it stands out on the shelf. Who gets the credit for designing the bottle for you? Our entire team. You know, it, 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 uh, the original partners, you know, we, uh, we, we did it. You know, we did it all internally. And there were only two design shapes in play. One of them was just a little taller and a little more slender. But it still had the same basic shape. I didn't like the taller, more slender bottle because I just felt like it was what I told the design team was to, to man it up a little bit to make the shoulders a little more broad. So they brought the bottle down where it wasn't so tall and thin and brought the shoulders out a little bit. And that's how okay, we let's show this again, just so people yeah, can there you go. The so it's a little broader there. And, uh, you know, it, it, you're right. It's very recognizable. At the very beginning, it was scary. I mean, there was nothing like it out there. And the bottle's got some femininity to it that you normally don't see in, in bourbon bottles or any whiskey bottles for that matter. So back in 2010, 2011, it was even more of a stretch. So um, everybody takes everybody deserves credit for it on the team and as well as, you know, deciding on Angel's Envy, the name, the wings. Um, I think I've you can see those. Really, the reason behind the wings being on the back of the bottle is that. I always wanted something on the back of my bottle. I, I remember I don't remember the Bowmore bottles that used to have ships on the back. Yeah. I love that. I thought it looked so cool when you looked through the distillate and saw something on the back of the bottle. So I had in my head, even before we talked about wings or angels or angels envy, that I wanted something reversed on the back of the bottle that, uh, you know, so that's how that kind of came about. And I, I stuck by that all the way through and it just happened to work out where we you know to where we are today and i think tabitha emptied her full-size bottle into a sample bottle because she's saying that uh, one of these is her infinity bottle now and i think i'm reading that right and i'm sure she'll correct me if i'm wrong but uh, as nurse dave points out spend an hour talking to mark and you raise your sales by at least one bottle hey we like that guys we want you to support our sponsors but we want you to support all bourbon makers and all whiskey makers too buy the ones you like for sure. And, you know, there's there's so many brands to support. There's so many great brands out there that I enjoy also. And, you know, uh, I, I encourage everybody to try everything that they can get their hands on. What did you try I growing do. up? What did you have the chance to try growing up around your dad, who was distilling at Brown Foreman? You would be surprised at the small amount of, of sampling and, and drinking I did back then. And I think a lot of it has to do, which is kind of a shame in a way because of, you know, dad's stature in the industry. And and as a child, you don't really think about that. You just, in terms of that, it's just your dad. And that's what dad does every day when he goes to work. So, and there was always whiskey around the house. So it was like a commodity for me. It, It was not something that, that it was like any other commodity in your home there was nothing sexy about it to me. I didn't really understand the history, not understand, but didn't really, you know, appreciate the history of it. Didn't appreciate my dad's position in the history of it. So um, I I didn't do a lot of that until I was older. You know, um, as I got up drinking age, I drank cheap ass Jim Beam and some other stuff that just, you know, just because it was there. And as I got a little bit older, certainly I began to appreciate. And uh, when dad created Woodford, that opened a whole new world for me um, also. So it's, it's been a, it's been a fun journey, but I did not take advantage as a younger person of, of all the opportunities I could have had to try some stuff or, or spend time with some of the, the other uh, barons in the business, you know, um, that were alive when dad, you know, when dad was in the business early. And you joined those barons in the uh, bourbon hall of fame two years ago, following in your dad's footsteps. What was that like? Yeah, that was a very surreal thing for me. It, it, um, it really, to this day, it was very emotional. I was, I was sad that dad was not there, 
the most impressive thing to me were the the other folks that are in the Bourbon Hall of Fame and how much respect I have for them and the other inductees that day. I'm like, wow, I can't believe I'm on the stage, you know. And I look out there and I see Jimmy Russell and you know I see all these 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 folks who have done so much to contribute to the bourbon industry. And you know, part of me was like, what am I doing up here? And and then you know I started thinking, you know, Angels Envy, we've created one of the fastest growing, uh, uh, highest rated small batch bourbons in, in, in recent history in the state of Kentucky, if you think about it in the last, you know, 50 years or so. So I think that was a great accomplishment, not just attributed to me, certainly, but from our whole team. So, so then I was like, you know, as I see that, I'm like, okay, you know, cause it, it's just my day to day, Mark, you know, we're out there, you know, punching the clock every day, spreading the bourbon gospel, we don't really think about where we've been and all the people who have, have, have appreciated Angel's Envy and bought Angel's Envy and supported us that have allowed us to create something that's very special and doesn't come along every day. It really doesn't. So you mentioned that you didn't take advantage of the things your dad could have taught you about bourbon when you were growing up, let's say. How did you correct that problem with your sons? Well, first of all, I made up for lost time with my dad as we, you know, I mean, I was always, I mean, dad and I always talked about bourbon and about the science and, you know, about the business, but um, the hands-on stuff, I didn't get to much later, you know, with the boys, I immersed them in, you know, Kyle got to work with my dad. My oldest got to work with, with uh, his grandfather before he passed for a few years. So he spent a lot of time immersed in that. And I've just made sure the boys have every bit of knowledge they can get and really just threw them into things. And uh, they, they know a lot about a lot of different places in the business. So I want them to learn everything about making bourbon and, 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 and man, the bourbon business, not just on the production side, not just on the operation side. My son, Andrew, is now working in supply chain and logistics. So the, he was a, he was a lead, our lead distiller, but now he's he's working in supply chain. So that's something that's very critical to our business, and it's something new for him to learn. How's that affecting you guys? By the way, we're hearing all sorts of issues with supply chain problems with uh, bottles, corks, pretty much everything that requires a truck delivery to Louisville. How's that affecting you guys? It, it's put us in a little pinch, I think, on the glass side. Uh, Bacardi, it's uh, you know Bacardi, our parent company now, are wonderful amazing parent company is having supply chain issues, um, major supply chain issues, just like anybody who imports uh, a lot of stuff. You know, the ports are backed up. Uh, once stuff gets to a port, like you said, just because it gets to a port doesn't mean it's going to get unloaded off a ship. And if it gets unloaded off a ship, it doesn't mean there's going to be a truck or a driver to drive it to the destination in the United States. So that that, that is a problem for everyone. So hopefully it'll start to resolve here soon. But, you know, Andrew was, t- I was talking to Andrew the other day. He said, Dad, you picked a really fun time to send me to supply chain and logistics, you know, because it's like one of the worst, uh, you know, crises, you know, our industry's had in that in that area uh, ever, probably. So I'm like, Andrew, that's how you learn, man. You know, you, you trial by fire, jump in there. And if you can do it now, guess what? If you can do it now, it'll be a piece of cake later, right? Oh, yeah. No, I'm just, I'm laughing because... Uh... I'm thinking of just a personal story here, just upstairs. I haven't been able to use our dishwasher in months because we need to replace the heating element for it. And that thing is stuck on a ship somewhere coming over from Asia where it was manufactured. And I can't get the replacement part because there are no replacement parts for that damn dishwasher anywhere in the country. So, yeah, I know from I'm seeing logistics issues like that, but it's got to be when you're sourcing bottles that you've got to get out to your customer base and you can't get those bottles through, it's really got to be even more um, nerve wracking than me not being able to use the stupid dishwasher because I can wash the dishes by hand. Well, I was going to say, Mark, you probably remember back to the dark days, you know, when you did have to wash dishes, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but no, but Are who you wants kidding? to go back? I, was, I like to joke. I was the human remote control back before we had real remote controls for the TV. There you go. It was my dad going, get your butt up change, and go change the channel. Change the channel. I remember we had our first TV remote. It was this big, it had big, it had big buttons on the top of it. It, 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 it probably, probably sent some type of radiation or something into your body. You know, who knows? I used to stand, when, when the first microwave stood out, came out, my, my buddy had one. 
a very wealthy family and they had like the first microwave on the block. I was scared to get close to that thing, man. I'd, 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 I'd close it and stand back. But, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's amazing how life changes when we don't have those things that, that, that are, make life easier and really free up time. Yeah. I look, I look at things like that in terms of how do those, and those are luxuries, you know, not everybody around the world has a dishwasher or whatever we're talking about, but what those things do is that frees up time for us to do other things. And hopefully we, we enjoy life in those times that we're not, you know, washing dishes or whatever we're doing. Doing things like making good whiskey. There you go. I can always find time to do that. So looking at the calendar, it seems like it is about time, oh, in the next six to eight weeks or so, for you to have some sort of an announcement about this year's cask strength modeling. Yeah, I think so. Um, honestly, I don't know when we're going to do it. You know, we, we usually release cask, um, you know, November-ish or so, and I say ish because it never seems to uh, – to come out when we think it's going to come out, either it comes out before or after. But uh, the barrels that we've pulled for cask and we've set aside for cask are, cask are phenomenal. We're making some changes to the box this year, like we do every year, but I think you'll notice some fun changes there. Um, I can't really describe what it's going to be like yet because I don't know. I really don't know. And um, uh, But I, I promise it'll be good. I hope. I mean, you know, I promise it'll be good because it, it's not going to make it out the door if it's not. And just a quick comment from Bill Ricker. Mark's dishwasher is what jammed the Suez Canal. There That's you a go. really bad joke, Bill, because, yeah, we think it was. It was jammed. It was on one of the ships that got backed up during the Suez Canal fiasco. So be that as it may. Good question here from Whiskey Canuck up in Montreal. Since there is no official definition, how do yeah. you guys define small batch? You know, that, that's been a topic of a lot of discussion over the last few years. Even It's, it's even been a litigation from some of these uh, ambulance chasing uh, plaintiff's lawyers. Um, well, tell you us know. how you really feel about them, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Just saying. Um, you know, handcrafted small batch, you know, those phrases are thrown around quite a bit. And there's no standard for it. I mean, there's no standard in the industry that, that defines it. Uh, there's really no standard, I think, where consumers define it. That's why there's a question like this. Uh, where I've come down on this is the small batch or, or handcraft or whatever you want to call it is not a number. It's a mentality. And, and we are still producing Angels Envy the same way today as we produced it from the very beginning. It may be on a little bigger of a scale. But the production methodology is still the same. The quality control is still the same. The, you know, all of the sampling we do, all the, you know, all the analytics we do, everything to to provide that consistency, is is still being done the, the the same way. So I believe that that small batch or craft that's another word that's used in there a lot. What's craft yeah. distilling is not really a number. Now you could argue to say that I'm saying that because we're a bigger company now, and I still want to be considered a small batch, but and compared to the, to the real big companies, we still are small, but you know, it is, it is your mentality of the organization. It's your production methodology. And I think all those things, it's a, you know, kind of fold into craft small batch. You know, that's a great question. I love that. I haven't heard that in a while. Yeah. I'm not sure you get to claim small batch or craft if you're buying all of your whiskey and not doing anything to it yourself. Um, uh, some of these folks that like to call themselves craft distillers, but they're buying from MGP or somebody else and buying industrial size amounts of booze. And then they say, oh, yeah, well, we're small batch because, well, we buy them in small batches like the size right. of a truck. Something you know, like I, that. I, I've got a lot of feelings about that and the, how the, the title master distiller and how that's used now, you know, as a as a marketing you know, more of as a marketing tool than it is an actual master of their craft. Uh, you know, I really, I cringe every time I hear that, you know, anybody that has a still that calls themselves a master distiller, you know, you can call yourself a distiller. If you're able to make whiskey, call yourself a distiller, but, you know, um, spend 25, 30 years honing your craft and then, then you can adopt the, the title master um, to go along with that. But Mark, I agree completely with what you said. And look, there's a place for all these. And ultimately, the marketplace decides what's successful, what's not successful. And the, the marketplace is smart. Our consumers are smart. 
and and they are able to see through things. And um, you know, and 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 look at, at the end of the day, no matter what somebody calls what's in that bottle, if it's good, it's good. If it's not good, it's not good. But you, you always want transparency. We we always want to be honest with uh, what we're up to and how we've gotten where we are. And as long as you're doing that, I, I think you're okay. I've always used to joke that if you really want to define yourself a master distiller, walk into a room with guys like your dad, Jimmy Russell, Parker Beam, and those folks and introduce yourself as a master distiller. And if those guys don't break up laughing or worse, smack you upside the head, then you've probably earned the title of a master distiller. Those were the, those guys. You, you, you nailed it. I mean, those guys are the still the the standard, I believe. And I don't think there are a lot of people out there in the industry now that can claim that type of experience. You know, the, those number of years, and and there are, um, but you don't see as many of them public facing. You know, you see some of like Greg Metz was a real good example. You know, Greg yeah. was a great distiller for years and years and made great stuff, but Greg was never out in the public, you know, until, until he retired or till right before he retired. So there are people out there, you know, Andrea at, uh, at Michter's, you know, I mean, she was very, worked very quietly behind the scenes and, but, you know, yeah. the, so I guess maybe I have kind of take that back. There are probably masters out there, but it, I still cringe when, when, when I hear that, that, that title thrown around, in a way that, that that is disrespectful to the people that have been doing it for look, I've been asked why I don't call myself the master distiller or why I haven't put my name on the bottles master distiller. And that's the very reason why I haven't. Uh, number one, I want to keep dad's name on there as our master distiller to honor my father. Number two, you know, dad forgot more about whiskey than I'll ever know. And uh, maybe one of my kids will, will be uh, to that point in their life where they can take that, that title but I won't. The boys will just fight over who gets it. Yeah, that, that, that yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, no, no doubt about it. And Sibling rivalry. I kid, of course. You, you kind of got to split the baby there. You kind of got to, okay, you can do this, but you can do this, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, you kind of got to spread things out. And, uh, you know, with four in the business and two more that aren't in the business yet because they're too young, I, I don't know what it's going to be like if we have six. <laughs> Great comment from Dave Kuhn. The one bottle I will likely never open my in my house is an Angel's Envy 2550-25 blend selected by my friend Jerry Slater for his last restaurant, H. Harper Station. Maybe when he's an old, old man, we'll drink it. Do you remember that one? I don't remember that, that batch, but I, I love the special blend program that we were doing years ago. We weren't able to sustain it because of inventory. And it was really labor intensive. We've come back out with a pilot of a single barrel program, which has been wildly uh, over uh, appreciated. And, and uh, but it's just a very small basis. But I think that's really cool, Dave. Um, you know, those blends were were done by the, the the proprietors of these bars and restaurants. They actually sat down and blended their own whiskey. And and there there's nothing like that that blend that he was talking about. There are no blend like that any, anywhere in the world. So it's truly unique and truly a one-off. Uh, the master, I love I love the, the last the comment there. I made a few batches of home-brewed beer. I'm now the master brewer of your house. Of course you are. Um, and I, I would agree with that. That's our audience. Um, let's see. Good question here from Tabitha. Can we expect an Angel's Envy single malt if there isn't one already? You guys have stuck to bourbons or rice, but you could theoretically do a malt whiskey if you wanted to, right? There might be some laying around somewhere. Do tell. <laughs> I can't. Um, I it's will your tell company, you, Wes. You can we, do anything we, you want. We, we did join the, uh, uh, the American single malt group. So I don't know if that tells you anything or not. That's kind of working on standards for single malts in the United States. And I don't think we would do that if, if we weren't uh, either involved in that or intending to, to do some fun stuff like that. And that's a great thing about what we have now. We're able to, to experiment with those different things and, and do essentially whatever we want to do. And um, that is definitely an idea that, that, that we have uh, done some work on. 
It's going to be a minute, though. And as Nurse Dave points out, it's just us here. Nobody else is going to find out about this. I, it, my, the problem is my PR people are watching this, and then they'll I'll get a nasty gram after I get off here. So Chris Radcliffe uh, is asking, what whiskeys are you trying that inspire you to uh, try different things with Angel's Envy besides single malts? Oh, wow. That is a really tough one. You know, I'm always looking at what everybody else is doing, but but I'm not. You know, it, we were, we, were taught, we had a meeting yesterday talking about innovation. And, you know, we, we brought in a bunch of, innovation gurus to help kind of streamline the innovation process from a, from a, uh, just from, from a process standpoint, not from a creative standpoint, but from a process standpoint, because I think we've got the creativity part down. You know, I, 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 um, I, I told the team that, that I prefer to be a, a trend setter and not a trend copier. So, but that doesn't mean I can't find inspiration from other whiskeys out there. And that doesn't mean that, that I don't taste stuff and say, wow, this is really great. How did they get here? Uh, you know, but I mean, we're a finished whiskey. So, you know, I'm looking at other secondary barrels that other people are using and, you know, uh, just other things. You know, I have mad respect for, for a lot of stuff that's going on out there. But I can't really name a particular whiskey right now that, that really that I'm saying I really want to do what they're doing. I'm really looking at Angel's Envy and saying, what can I do with what we have? And, and how can I be creative with, with what we have? But that leads uh, to an interesting question. What will your own distillate taste like not finished in a barrel? Might you release a regular Angels Envy bourbon that isn't port finished from your distillate? Well, if it's not good going in, it's not good coming out. So, you know, you're always to get to get good whiskey, you have to start out with good, with you know, to get good finished whiskey, you have to start out with good whiskey. We had that same conversation the other day. And by the way, I do think the doers is, is great stuff. The experimentation that they're doing is incredible. Um, we talked about that on the innovation call. You know, we've kind of made a decision as a company that anything that we uh, are, are going to release under the Angel's Envy flag is a finished whiskey. Now, just because we decided that several years ago doesn't necessarily mean that's where we're always going to be or we're always going to end up. So, you know, we're open-minded to other things, to to other... And, 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 and look, you know, what... And I said this on the call the other day, too, is that... You know, we've kind of defined this category. I really believe this. I think Angel's Envy has defined the finishing category. And so, but what is finishing? You know, if we've defined the category, then then we can expand the category. Is finishing always a secondary barrel? You know, are there other things we can do with the whiskey to 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 finish it or have a ha, add something else to the process to 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 add some unique characteristics to it. And I don't know what that is yet, but I can tell you that's where my mind is going, um, is, uh, is in that direction to, and being very open, open-minded to, 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 to those things. So, so you never know, Mark, um, you never know what, what you're, I never, I never say never, but, uh, that's, that's, that's where we are right now. All I know is I would love to taste some of your whiskey and hopefully when I get to the distillery, at oh, some can. point here pretty soon. I want to taste your stuff before it goes into a port barrel. I want to see yeah. what the bourbon you're creating before it goes into the port tastes like, just for fun. Um, You'll love it. Tabitha points out that uh, she would like Angel's Envy to become more available in the UK. Uh, had to pay through the nose at a shop in London for her bottle. How are you guys well, we, coping with the uh, tariffs and the exports these days? Well, I hate that, Tabitha. I don't, we don't want you paying through the nose. Uh, maybe a little bit of blood is fine, but not 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 a lot of pain. Um, you know, we're expanding our international footprint to to more more product in the UK, more product in some other uh, in the EU as well. Uh, we're we're taking our our time, but you'll definitely start to see more over there. And I'm also looking for some more reasons to come back and visit because I love it in that part of the world. And I may be over there in October or so. So I can't really give you a time frame. The tariffs haven't really been a big issue with us at our at our price point. And truthfully, we haven't been ex- exporting a ton. 
So exponentially, it's, it hasn't hurt us like it's hurt, you know, Brown Foreman and some of these other companies that, that have a really big international platform. But um, I hope to be over there with more as soon as possible. But, but thanks for, for going that extra mile because I know it's not, it's not cheap over there. And Tabitha thinks that Angel said they would actually be a good bourbon for some scotch drinkers to try. It is. I mean, if, if you drink scotch, you're, you're accustomed to secondary barrels. Um, you know, Brown Foreman owned Glen Morangie and dad loved Glen Morangie. So I think some of our inspiration came from that. And I'm, I love Balvini. I love some of the, some of the things that they've come out with. Uh, their, their finishes are very subtle. Like our port finish is very subtle. Now our rye, there's nothing subtle about the rye finish at all. That's, that's really aggressive and really in your face. But I, I would agree with that statement that Angel's Envy is a good, uh, gateway for scotch drinkers into bourbon. And we also had a quick comment here from just a second here. I'm trying to find it from Dave Kuhn, because we know that a lot of bourbon barrels wind up over in Scotland. Are there any scotch distilleries that are using your barrels that you know of? Uh, Dewar's is one for sure. Um, We've sent some barrels to, uh, I think we sent some barrels to Patron also. That was just for fun. But obviously, that's not a not a Scotch distillery. But uh, Dewar's is one for, for certain that we have uh, we have barrels that have been been sent there, and hence my comment earlier about some of the experimental stuff that they've done. That limited release, uh, those three seven fives they've been coming out with have won a ton of awards, and you know, and we we think of Dewar's a lot of times as our grandfather's Scotch. You don't particularly think of them as being innovative or being anything that's that really blows your shorts up. But what they're doing now, and, and, and it's always been great, but pushing the envelope and reintroducing doers to to the world through these uh, these special releases, I think, is a really, really good move. No arguments there. Um, and full disclosure, doers is one of our sponsors, as well as uh, your sister brand and under the Bacardi ownership here. Um, oh, well, good. So I did a, I did a commercial for Yeah, him. you helped a us out with that. Thank you. A commercial within a commercial. Right. I like that. Our pal Crumb wants to know, obviously your dad had to have spent some time with Booker, Jimmy, Elmer. Got any stories from back then or from when you had a chance to sort of sit around and watch these guys? Jimmy always still likes to tell me stories about doing stuff with dad. You know, the the, the big thing that, that I remember is that these guys – were just full throttle. They would be out anywhere in the world. You know, I mean, dad was in, went to Japan. He went all over the place. You know, these guys would be out till three or four in the morning and take a 6 a.m. flight somewhere and then go do it again. And, and, you know, and, and, and keep long and manage to, to be part of the production um, as well. So I just know that, that, and I was able to spend time with, uh, with those guys and, uh, especially Jimmy. I spend as much time with Jimmy as I possibly can. I haven't seen him since COVID, but you know, Jimmy's kind of the the last uh, treasure in that, in that generation. So, you know, I've got some stories I can tell. I don't think I can tell them here, but, um, oh, you but can. no, 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 I can't. But, um, but, but I tell you, you know, just salt of the earth, great people, uh, passionate about, bourbon and Kentucky and good family people. Uh, As much time as I can spend, uh, I'm grateful. And I've been spending some time with Bill Samuels lately as well. Uh, You know, Bill, I love Bill. I love what he did with makers and and his uh, business sense. And he's just a super, super nice person. But, you know, we're not getting any younger. And, you know, those guys, that generation, you know, like I said, we've lost all of them, really, except for Jimmy and, and Bill. And I hope we don't lose either of them anytime Absolutely. soon. Absolutely. Same here. Same here. We do need to clarify something because a couple of comments have come in. Um, Brown Foreman never owned Glen Morangie. Let me explain what they Brown used Foreman to had own. the U.S. distribution rights for oh, Glen Morangie. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Uh, because, so, so, there, so, yeah. There was a relationship with, yeah. with Glen Morangie, and, and that's how Dad really kind of fell in love with that. But he did spend time over there. I know there was influence on their part yeah. as, as far as um, innovation and, and maturation. So that, that's a that's a good clarification. 
Yeah, I just want to clarify that because uh, that has come up. Brown Foreman originally years and years ago had the U.S. rights to distribute Glenmorangie Morangy Scotch in the U.S. That's where they all worked together. But uh, because people are saying, well, wait a second. No, no. Brown Foreman owns Glendronic, not Glen Morangy. So I'll make sure we clarify that for everybody who's watching in the chat rooms because uh, they're going, wait a second. No, no, no. Let's just make sure we get it straight. Good right catch. Now. You know, it doesn't change my story, though. Oh, yeah. You know, the story is still a good one, though. And as Christopher Malloy points out, all very nostalgic, grateful these whiskeys didn't turn into Tang or Coca-Cola. We can all say thank God to that, Christopher. You know, and that's always a danger. I mean, it's a good point. You know, when, when, when companies grow and when they're acquired and the industry changes, you know, you, we, have to produce, we have to protect the integrity of bourbon, and, and especially of Kentucky bourbon. And if we don't, that's how you end up with, you know, new Coke or, you know, or things that, that, that are Tang or if anybody, half of this, half of the people on the same probably don't know what Tang is, but, um, you know, you, uh, you have to guard that history or you lose it. Oh, us old farts know exactly what Tang was. I remember the, the Apollo missions. I know what Tang is. I'm barely old enough. So to remember, um, but I'm just I'm kidding. Um, but I so- remember it. I'm going to throw this out there just off the top of my head because I keep getting these pitches from innocent, wide-eyed PR people for these Franken whiskeys that are created in labs. What's your take on these things? Because I'm just looking at I'm going, yeah, that's really nice, but I'm sorry. If it didn't hit a still and it didn't hit a barrel, it's not whiskey. You know, there's a lot of hocus pocus and smoke and mirrors, and I still don't think that there's a, to- a substitute for time and Mother Nature and distillation and all that stuff. And you know, I, I don't. I think it will be very difficult to replicate that. But even if you could closely replicate it, I mean, where's the story behind that? Where's the the history? Where's the the family connection? You know, what what what's, what is there to talk about other than it was birthed in a lab? Um, you know. If it if it ever becomes close to the same as 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 you know as as whiskey as we know it, so I'm I'm very skeptical. Uh, you know, I've never been a fan of some of that stuff that's out there, and it'll it'll I probably never will be. Um, but you know, but I'm an old old guy, and you know how old people are. You know, we do we we don't respond as well to changes, but. Wait you know, a once, second, wait a second. You said you were barely old enough to remember Tang, and I know I remember it, so that puts you younger than me. So don't call yourself old, because I know I'm an old fart. Well, I use that when it's convenient, you know. I mean, yeah. when, it, when, it, when it makes my point or gets me a discount or something like that, then, <laughs> then, I'm, then, I'm, then I'm old. Otherwise, I'm very young. So we have a question from Graham Frazier. Did your dad ever meet up with Bill Lumsden? And I'm sure that those two probably had some times together. I'm sure they did. I don't really know any direct stories there, but, you know, dad, dad was all over the planet and, and, um, you know, anybody that was anybody, you know, they, I'm sure they crossed paths along the way. So what did your dad think of those last few years when he was touring the road, I remember meeting him at the Brandy Library for the first time in New York for an Angel's Envy tasting, uh, probably 2011, 2012, just after you guys founded the brand, when he and the other, the Bourbon Barons, the Jimmys, the Elmers, the uh, Parkers, had become the rock stars of the world, of the whiskey world. What did he think of all that back then? Uh, yeah, dad coming out of retirement, you know, part, part of me wanting to get dad out of retirement was, well, first of all, I couldn't have done it without him. Second of all, I really felt like he had a lot of creativity that he never got to. I don't really believe he was ready to retire. You know, he got to the age where companies start kind of retiring you as opposed to you really wanting to retire. And, you know, part of me was kind of like to prove a point, you know, Um, you know, and 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 I don't think dad maybe as he got older and closer to before he passed, 
I don't think dad ever really understood his, his place in the history of bourbon, which I think is hugely significant. If you look at the entire history of bourbon, I think dad, you know, you could probably count 20 people and dad would, would surely be one of those people on the most influential list. And he never looked at himself that way. Um, but towards the end, he really started to feel the love and, and, and to see people come out, you know, but he was just as excited or even more excited about passing on that to me and to his grandsons and, and that, but that's just the way he was, you know, he was not focused on himself. He was focused on, on making others happy with the stories and his whiskey and, and, and trying to, to work with us. So, so we had the same opportunities that, that he did. So at the end, he really got to see, and I pushed him out there as much as I could, not, not just because I wanted him for public, be in public. I wanted him to see that appreciation and respect and all those things that everybody had for him. You know, it was very important for me to make sure that he knew that. But he was still consulting for folks like Suntory in mm-hmm. Japan after he retired from Brown Foreman. Yep. And he really wasn't retired for that long before you dragged him back into uh, Angel's Envy, right? No, I mean, he he did a few things for sure. Suntory, um, you know, he would do some Whiskey Fest seminars for them and you know, mostly for, for Yamazaki, which he loved Japanese whiskey. He loved traveling to Japan. So that was kind of more of a pet project for him than anything. But I think Dad was also instrumental, you know, as Japanese whiskeys just started getting distribution in the United States. And, you know, I think they needed that credibility in the United States. Not, not that their whiskey needed credibility, just that people weren't, weren't, weren't familiar as my wife walks into the frame behind me here. <laughs> That's okay. Anyway, she can, she can your, join. Your long-suffering if, wife. If you want to hear the, the, the true story, yeah, you need to, you can talk to her sometime. Oh, she, yeah, let's bring her in. Let's bring no, her no, in, no, Wes. No, 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 definitely not. But um, Oh, you, you don't want her to tell the whole story, do no, you? No, no, no. I only want the story as I can tell it, which is, which is the good stuff. The official story. The official story. No, I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll that's like the official that. story behind Whiskey Cast. There's my story, and then there's the truth that my family tells. Everybody who knows me knows that I'm not shy of saying whatever's on my mind, so it's all good. <laughs> and as Whiskey Canuck points out, let's get the real dirt. <laughs> the real dirt. I think you've been getting it. You know, we've yeah, been talking so, about st- stuff that I don't, you know, that, that, that just whatever comes to mind. But thank you. Go ahead. So what's the best lesson your dad ever taught you about whiskey? Mm. Uh, drink it. Don't let it sit on a shelf. You know, if, if, if we've signed a bottle, you know, drink it. We'll sign another one. Um, there are, but that one I would not open quite yet. I'd yeah. wait for that one. And that bottle design is also different. If compare that to a current bottle design, the type below the signature while on the front, mm-hmm. the font is bigger. And um, it, it's, uh, if, if you compare it to a current bottle. So there are very few of those out there, Mark. Very few of those out there on the market. Well, you'll never see this one on an auction because I will drink the some bitch before that happens. Right, and I know you will, and 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 yeah. that's um, you know, I, I kind of one of my beliefs is is that that storytelling is is part of spirits, and there are so many stories in that bottle to be told and to be shared, and you can't do that unless you open the bottle and, and start sharing and start telling those stories. So, yeah. you know, that, that's how I, that's what I believe. And that's probably closely aligned to what dad always said and what dad always, you know, taught me and just taking it a step further. Well, normally it sits on the shelf uh, behind where the camera is next to a, a bottle of whistle pig signed by Dave Pickerel. Which we also, oh. That's can't a, replace that one either. So no, no. God bless Dave. You know, I mean, uh, and I, I should I should always mention Dave on the list of, of folks that. And it's, I still can't believe he's gone. So that's really yeah. probably why I don't mention it in the list of the greats that aren't with us anymore. Uh, but Dave is is certainly not only one of the most amazing humans I've known, but um, but truly a treasure to this business. 
And as Bill Ricker points out, those of us aging gracefully who forget to take our reading glasses into stores are thankful for the larger print on your bottles now. We know that wasn't your idea, but no. yes, we do appreciate that. Same for me. Same for me. I can't, if out my glasses, I can't see it. One final question from Dave Kuhn. What do you drink regularly that isn't Angel's Envy? I try a lot of stuff. I love Old Forester, and I love what they're doing. I love the innovations that that they're uh, that they have. I like some of the older Eagle Rare. I'm not a, I'm not wed to eight statements or big believer in eight statements, but I love some of the Eagle Rare eight statement stuff, the older stuff. Um, Whistle Pig is another brand that I'm very fond of. I'm curious to see how they go now that Dave's um, gone, but. You know, I, it's it's a it's a whirlwind of, of choices out there. But um, those are some of my my favorites and some of my go tos. Graham Frazier wants to know if Lincoln did many interviews that are still available online. Yes, we have them at the Whiskey Cast website. Just do a search. Do we that have interviews with 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 uh, Lincoln. Do that. And, and they, no, there's not a lot. I tried to get his dad in front of as many cameras as I could and do as many things as he could. He did, he did a good interview before the whiskey classic in Louisville one year or the bourbon classic that I think is available online somewhere. But if you YouTube, there are things that pop up on dad and most of it are just little snippets where you see his personality. But that one interview, like, like Mark, of course, you're a great interviewer as well, but the one we did at the bourbon classic as a family, I think was very good as well. So, uh, so yeah, if you get a chance, go, uh, and, and if you, if you're looking for, for more, you know, thoughts on that or, or trying to, and if you find some good stuff, let me know on social media. I'm at KY Bourbon Maker, at KY Bourbon Maker. Let me know uh, when you find stuff because I, I wouldn't mind seeing it too if I couldn't find it. And let, let me just uh, bring up your comment, brought up a question from Christopher Malloy. Why don't you believe in age statements? We don't see, uh, with the exception of the uh, anniversary la- edition last year, the 10 year. You haven't released an age statement, uh, Angels Envy. Well, there's that goes back to dad as well. You know, that's another lesson that, that, that I, I really talk about maturity. I very rarely talk about age. And uh, there's some real truth behind that. You know, one could argue that people don't like age statements if they don't have old whiskey. Um, I, 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 I believe that there is an over-reliance on age statements uh, that, that, the, the higher the age statement implies to a lot of folks, but not, not probably not a lot of the folks listening to this or watching this because they're educated with bourbon, but just because it's got a big number on it doesn't equate to good whiskey. And, you know, our studies tell us that really 68 years is the optimum aging period for whiskey. And after that, it starts taking on fewer and fewer characteristics from a consumer standpoint that they like. I say they, you know, you know what I mean? Um, but, but I'm not, that's not a guidepost, but that's, that's really kind of my personal favorite too. I like stuff that clocks in around the eight year, you know, six to eight year, um, you know, time period. So it's not that I'm opposed to age statements or, um, it's just that, that I think they're often misconstrued and there's an over-reliance placed on and a price premium on them. That's probably a lot more than what you're getting in, in some cases. Well, let's call it there. And as Christopher Malloy points out, I don't mind the NAS if it's a cheap whiskey. Well, it has to be a good whiskey first. Yeah. Cheap and good are not necessarily mutually exclusive. You can have inexpensive good whiskeys that are NAS, and you can have really expensive NAS whiskeys that are crap, just as you can have good age statement whiskeys that are inexpensive and others that are expensive. It's all uh, up to the taste. It's up to your taste and it's really what you like. So, uh, right. What do you like? Is it good? Yeah. It's got to be good. If it's uh, good, it doesn't matter how old it is. And it doesn't matter where it came from. You know, it, it really doesn't. Now, now there has to be truth in, 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 in how we talk about these products, but you know, if it's good, it's good, and and that's really at the end of the day. And and but the and the consumer is the ultimate arbiter. Yeah, you know, they will decide what the market will support and what the market won't support. So I'm just thankful that that we've been blessed that people who support what we do, and hopefully people continue to support what we do. 
Well, I know that uh, I will continue to support what you guys do because the whiskey has always been good. And uh, when I get out to Louisville, I can't wait to uh, come by and see the distillery and see what you guys are doing with the uh, Visitors Center expansion. And uh, try some of that whiskey before it hits the port barrels just to get a uh, baseline for what the port does to it. Wes Henderson, thank you for joining us. Give our best to the boys and to your wife and uh, Thanks, to all of your folks at Angels Envy. And uh, once again, you can find them on the web at angelsenvy.com. Once again, that's our Happy Hour live webcast as it aired live on July 16th with Wes Henderson of Angels Envy Bourbon. Our live shows start every Friday at 5 p.m. New York time, 10 p.m. London time, and during the summer, 2100 GMT. You can watch live and submit your own questions on our YouTube channel and the WhiskeyCast Facebook page, and they're also available live on Twitter and Twitch. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Thanks again to our presenting sponsors, Dewars and Redbreast, along with Writer's Tears, Sagamore Spirit, Oban, and Catoctin Creek. And don't forget to join us each week for our regular episode of Whiskey Cast with more cast strength conversation. Whiskey Cast is a presentation of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2021, and comes to you from the charming yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.